glad to be back. I love doing these. I always look forward to, uh, to presenting to the Warrior Group and always hopefully bringing some information of value that you can literally take this afternoon into practice to make you better clinicians and get better results for people. And so this year, one of the things we had done, uh, I know Ed, uh, Drs. Ed and Yuri had sent out a poll saying, what did you guys want to learn this year? And then we kind of looked at the information that was sent back and we chose topics according to, uh, accordingly to some of the requests that we had. One of the requests that we had was to look at the lumbar spine and specifically look at um, the lumbar dental roll and how the lumbar dental roll can obviously aid us in practice to get better clinical results. And so I just shared my screen. Just give me a thumbs up in the, in the little windows there for a few people, if you can see it, perfect. And everybody can hear me good, not too loud. Excellent. All right, so the lumbar dental roll, we're gonna get into it here. And so with the questions on the lumbar dental roll, the, the few docs who had asked about the lumbar dental roll, here are some of the topics they wanted to know. Obviously the indications. When do we that when do we use it? How do we use it? You know, what is the sort of the X-ray analysis to to know the X-ray analysis to know when should I be using a lumbar dental roll versus not using one? Another question was what exercises should be used in conjunction with the lumbar dental roll? There was a question about progressing a patient into larger sizes because those of you who have used it know that the lumbar dental rolls can be a they can be monsters, especially compared to the cervical. They are much more aggressive. The foam is much denser. And so they're hard to use. And oftentimes then we might decide to start with a smaller size and try and progress later on. So how do we progress later on? What does that look like? And obviously if it's a firm role, if it's more assertive, we'll say, patients tend to be less compliant because it hurts. So what are some of those tips and tricks that we can use to make our patients more compliant when using the lumbar dental roll? And then lastly, someone wanted to see some pre-post x-rays. So we're going to touch on three case studies where I'm going to present sort of information. And I, I'm hoping that you guys can sort of look at that information and make that clinical decision about what lumbar dental roll would you use in that case if I did a good job to present this information to you guys. So let's jump in. So just like the cervical spine, the lumbar dental roll is going to be prescribed to patients largely based on x-ray measurements. So we're taking our films, you take a lumbar film from the front, hopefully you're taking a lateral lumbar film as well. And from our lateral lumbar film, we're gonna look at two things, the total curve and the sacral base angle. When we measure the cervical curve, the cervical curve approximates a piece of a circle, okay? The lumbar curve is a little bit different in that it is more of an ellipse shape. So there's less curve up top and then there's a lot more curve down below. So it's not a circle, we call it an elliptical uh, form, it's, it's an ellipse. And so we wanna measure still the curve, very similar to how we measure the cervical curve. We're gonna take the top bone, which is L1, and we're gonna take the bottom bone, which is L5. The measurement process is the same. I put a dot, at the posterior superior aspect of L1, the posterior inferior aspect of L1, and then I have a line. So that red line that runs behind L1 is simply connecting my two dots, or AKA it's George's line. And we extend that line down far enough that it will intersect my line that is coming up from L5. So I do the exact same thing at L5. I put a dot, a dot, I intersect it. And then as it comes up, those two lines make an intersecting angle, which is my lumbar curve angle. So in a perfect world, I want it to be 40 degrees, okay? Now I'm gonna measure my sacral base angle. My sacral base angle should also be 40 degrees. It's very simple, right? I take my posterior superior aspect of S1, I put a dot there. And then basically what I'm gonna do is draw a line down the sacral end plate. I'm gonna go back to my dot. And then basically what I'm trying to do is this blue line you see here is a horizontal line out across. It's a perfectly good, horizontal line. And now I'm going to measure the angle between my horizontal line and my sacral end plate. That angle should also be 40 degrees. Okay. Now, some of you who have done this for longer might be saying, well, doc, are there times where it's not 40 degrees, right? If you've done the cervical webinars with me, you know that we talked about the, the inlet morphology of the thorax, right? And the PTSIA angle would allow us to know whether or not a cervical curve should be more or less than the ideal 42 degrees. The lumbar spine is identical. 
But for today's purposes, we're not going to get into those measurements and the details of pelvic incidence. We're going to assume that most people have a relatively normal pelvic incidence angle, and we're going to focus off of the 40 and 40 measurements. If you're more advanced and you want more information on this later, reach out to me and I'll tell you how you can measure the pelvic incidence angle and know with more specific detail, you know, if a patient should have 32 degrees instead of 40 or 52 degrees instead of 40, okay? But for today's, for today's purposes, we're assuming 40 and 40. So those are two of our indicators, right? I wanna see a loss of curve on X-ray and I wanna see a reduced sacral base angle. The third indicator that I'm often gonna see is what's called posterior thoracic translation or sometimes we'll interchange that with lumbar translation because it can be measured on a lumbar film, but it can also be measured on posture looking at the thorax relative to the pelvis. So we kind of, I, I, I might go back and forth using thoracic or lumbar, so don't get confused. We can use posterior thoracic or lumbar translation. We can use them interchangeably. So how do I measure it on thorax? So if I'm taking a posture picture and hopefully we're all looking at postures of our patients, I look at them from the side. So to represent the thorax, we use a dot at the AC joint. That would be the center of mass of the thorax. So I put a dot at the AC joint. My pelvis or my S1 is represented by a dot at the greater trochanter. So I put a dot at the trochanter, a dot at the, the uh, AC joint, and then I look to see, is the dot of the AC joint posterior to the dot of the trochanter? So as I'm looking at it here, I hope everybody can see that and is nodding along saying yes. Right, And we could just look at it, how this dot is sitting on this grid line right here. And then this dot, it's not quite on the grid line, but it's much closer to this grid line here. So if I was to draw those lines up and down, it should be clear to see that the thorax is sitting posterior to the pelvis. That is a definition of posterior thoracic translation. On x-ray, there's a very simple way to measure it. I just come to my T12 and I find the posterior corner of it, posterior inferior corner and that I would draw a vertical line straight down. And then I use the posterior inferior aspect of S1 and I could draw a line straight up. So this X-ray is this young man's X-ray, okay? So this posture equates to this X-ray. So on X-ray, yes, we can clearly see that T12 sits behind S1. So we have that posterior translation or I can measure it on posture by looking at AC joint relative to pelvis. So that would be my third indicator. That is a good patient to get a lumbar dental roll, right? So here I look, right? I talked about less curve. So this patient has got 33 degrees of curve. It's a reduced curve. Check, I have one indication. The sacral base angle here is measuring 28 degrees. That's less than my ideal 40, check. And I've got posterior translation. So that would be a case where I see all three indicators. I can use a lumbar orthotic. In this case, he needs it. Here's a case where they would not need the lumbar dental roll. So if I'm looking on posture, this one's much more subtle. That's why it's always good to take your measurements and double check things on x-ray. So if I put a dot at the greater trochanter here and I put a dot at the AC joint, ooh, they almost look perfectly lined up. But if you look very closely and the software measures it for me, the thorax is slightly anterior in posture. When I come to this young man's x-rays and I look here, if I drop a dot down from T12, I'll try and drop that down the best I can, as straight as I can. And then I come up from S1, we can see that yes, the center of max mass, sorry, the center of mass, <laughs> dyslexia, center of mass of the thorax is sitting anterior to my S1 on my pelvis. Okay, so he has anterior translation. So that's number one. So I'm missing an indicator there. Number two indicators, if I look here at my sacral base angle, right, and I was to draw my horizontal line out, you know, without even taking the measurement, I hope everybody can appreciate that that's well over 40 degrees. It's actually even over 45 degrees. This is going to be closer to 50 degrees. And then if I measure the lumbar curve here, I'm going to get approximately a 40 degree curve. So he's got a normal curve, he's anterior, and he has an increased sacral base angle. This is not a case that requires a lumbar dental Okay, so you always want those three indicators prior to giving somebody a lumbar dental roll. So we've got our indicators. We know how to measure it on the x-rays or on the posture. Now we're going to implement it. We're going to give the patient a dental roll to lay on at home. The lumbar dental roll is unique in that it allows us to put the peak. So we call this the peak and we call this part the tail. The lumbar dental roll can be used interchangeably. So I can have the peak higher up and the tail towards the bottom or towards the tailbone or I can have the peak lower down and the tail sloping back towards the thorax. 
You cannot do this with the cervical dental roll. But with the lumbar dental roll, we can. It can be used interchangeably. And we use it interchangeably depending on where I want to put the peak. So if I look at my x-ray and, you know, the x-ray is really bad from T12 to L2, you know, there's some degeneration there. or That's where it looks like I can use more curve. Well, I'll put the peak higher up and the slope or the tail towards my tailbone. So usually for setups of T12 to L3, this should say three here, not two. From T12 to L3, I'll usually put the peak up and the tail down. If I want to try and get L3 or lower, well, then I'm going to flip it the other way. I'll put the peak down and the tail up. So this kind of setup is when I'm trying to get L3 or lower. Okay, so we can flip it back and forth. Now, what's important to know about using the lumbar dental roll, okay, and again, this is a little bit more of an advanced concept, but I'm going to touch on it briefly anyways, is that when the patient lays back on that dental roll, and here's an example where she's not using any thoracic support whatsoever. Where is my... Hmm. There we go. Here's an example where the patient is not using any thoracic support whatsoever. So she's laying on that lumbar dental roll. Okay. If we can hallucinate, we can imagine a lumbar curve here. I'll draw a little lumbar curve. I'm going to put a dot at the greater trochanter. We'll say that's her greater trochanter. And if I was to look or imagine T12, I'll say T12 is right there. So if that patient was standing up, you can see how that lumbar dental roll has created a nice curve and it has pushed the lower thorax anterior to the pelvis. But now, because there's no support behind the upper thorax here, she's actually getting into extension, okay? In other words, T1, or the upper thorax, is sitting behind the lower thorax. And in some cases, you might want this, and that could be a clinical decision that you make. It's very rare, though. Most of the time when we're going to lay a patient on a lumbar dental roll, we at least want to give them a little bit of support. So here's 20 millimeters of support, just under an inch. And you can see that already it substantially reduces the amount of extension that happens in the thorax. So it gives it a bit more support and it makes it a little bit easier to lay on that dental roll. Okay. We'll talk about supports a little bit more later on based on what we see in terms of the x-ray presentation. But understand that you can do this if this is what you want to, but it is very challenging, and that does create a lot of extension in the patient's thorax. Usually, we want to give a little bit of support, and if you're using an even bigger dental roll, you're going to want to use a bigger thoracic support to drive the rib cage forward. Okay, exercises to be used in conjunction with the lumbar dental roll. There are two exercises that I give almost every single patient to do with the lumbar dental roll. Okay, there are plenty you can give them. You can add all kinds of functional lumbar exercises, prone thoracic extensions, all kinds. My favorite two are the Titanic because it's a great corrective exercise that mimics what the patient is doing on the lumbar dental roll. And the other one is the cat cow. The cat cow is a great functional exercise that's going to help build not only strength in the lumbar spine, it builds strength, neuromuscular recruitment, it helps to increase the movement of the lumbar spine, and it'll really reduce pain because it's going to, it's going to allow the lumbar spine to move better prior to laying on the lumbar dental roll. So this is the Titanic exercise, okay? So basically what we have the patient do is, and I can maybe zoom it back a little bit and I'll just start playing it. So these exercises can be found on my YouTube channel. So if you just go to Dr. Pascal uh, YouTube channel, I've posted these for you guys to watch. So you can see here, I've got a yoga block behind the shoulders. You have the patient do this standing against the wall. They put a block behind the shoulders. And what they do is they push their bum back to the wall. They open up their arms and that's driving the chest forward. So when my bum goes back to the wall like that, it creates anterior thoracic translation, right? If everybody's looking at the thorax here, we should be able to appreciate that the thorax is anterior to the pelvis. I also obviously have people bring their head back because why not correct cervical posture at the same time? If you were to take an x-ray of me standing in that position, you would see that I have more lumbar curve in this position than I do standing neutral. With pushing the bum back to the wall like that, it tilts the pelvis forward, which thereby also increases the sacral base angle. So this posture, this exercise, is, this exercise helps all three indicators of the lumbar dental roll, creates anterior thoracic translation, increases lumbar curve, and increases the sacral base angle. So I have almost, almost, almost every single one of my patients who does a lumbar dental roll perform this exercise. I have them do it for 20 repetitions, and then they hold it for 10 seconds, rest and repeat. Okay. Now let's see if we go here. Can everybody see now the tabletop position here? Check that everybody, that screen share went well. Good. 
Okay, so now the, the uh, cat-cow exercise. The cat-cow is not a corrective exercise. I do this one because most people are deficient in core, period. This is a great, simple exercise that is hard to mess up. People st start on all fours like this. The idea here is to gain neuromuscular recruitment, basically using the patient's brain to try and recruit and control the neurology in the lumbar spine, those small muscles to be able to control flexion and extension of the lumbar spine. So we're improving movement. The movement is done slowly. So anybody that has disc issues, degeneration or any issues like that can do this exercise because generally it's done so slow that they can stop prior to any type of sharp or substantial pain. And number two, it's just a great overall exercise to improve flexion and extension movement. So it's going to loosen up the tissues prior to them laying on the lumbar general. So for those of you who don't know this exercise, you simply start on all four like this, and then we're going to alternate between extension and flexion of the spine. So the first step is going to be just to drop the belly down towards the table, which is extension, increasing that lumbar curve, and then the head's going to go up. Whoops, that was the wrong one. Let's go back here, the bird dog. Cat cow. Okay, here we go. So now you're going to see the belly is going to drop down towards the table. Okay, so the belly drops down, the head goes up. That's lumbar extension. And this is only held for two or three seconds. Again, this is not a corrective exercise. And then they're going to flip. They're going to go the opposite direction where the belly button is going to suck to the spine and go into maximal flexion. Okay. And again, the reason this is not a corrective exercise, because actually this is flattening the lumbar spine and flattening the sacral base angle. So this is why both positions are held for only a couple seconds and we're just alternating back and forth between flexion and extension. Again, this is to make a stronger lumbar spine, improve movement, decrease pain, improve function. So they alternate between the extension position and the flexion position 20 times, contracting for two to three seconds at each end range, or sometimes I tell them not even to, to do a count. Like when I do this myself, I just do it for a full breath cycle. So in and out in one position, in and out in the next position, in and out, in and out, okay? Very good, one of my favorite exercises. So those are probably the two go-to exercises that I use all the time uh, in terms of improving results for the lumbar general. Sizing. The sizing of the generals is identical to that of sizing the cervical general. So if you're totally new to this, and you know, if this is somewhat overwhelming, too much information, and all you want to know is, doc, how do I give this to certain you know, patient demographics? We can go based on size. So the yellow is a small and or pediatric. So think of patients that are five foot or less, small patient, pediatric, you give them a small lumbar general. The next step up, so we'll say from five foot to five foot eight would be a medium lumbar general. And then anybody that is five, nine or above would be a large lumbar general. So if nothing else, if that's how you want to go for it, you can, but we should look at other factors because it is more complex than just looking at size alone. There are really four factors that we want to look at. One is size, two is patient rigidity, three is where am I trying to put the lumbar dental roll, and four is how much translation is there in that posture. So we just talked about size. Number two is rigidity. So the more rigid, the stiffer patient, the smaller dental roll you're going to give them. Because generally, if they're a rigid patient, the more rigid they are, the less they're going to be able to sort of arc over top of this increasingly large roll. So stiffer patients, automatically, the stiffer they are, the smaller roll you give them. And that applies identically to the cervical spine. We've talked about that before. You know, I would often give my older, more rigid patients a smaller den roll because they just don't have the flexibility to lay over top of a larger roll, even though their size states that they should be a medium and or large. Okay, so rigidity is a huge factor. Where you want to put it in the spine. So if you were trying to target, you know, L4-5 or L5-S1 only, you don't want to change any other segments of the spine. If the curve looks fine from, we'll say, L1 to L3 or L1 to L4, but you see a reduction at L5 and L, uh, sorry, L5-S1, kind of those lower segments of the lumbar spine, which I've seen plenty of those. So all I want to do is just change those segments. I'm going to use a small so I can be specific and just put the peak down at the distal lumbar spine only. The medium dental roll can technically be used anywhere in the lumbar spine. And the large dental roll, I only use it in the mid to upper lumbar spine. You know, is this a hard and fast rule based on dental rolls and how they were created? The answer is no. 
but this baby is simply too big to use at L4, L5. It is completely pointless to use a large lumbar denerol in the distal lumbar spine. Let me go back to this picture because I showed you the support block here. But this is a great picture as to why you shouldn't put a large lumbar denerol in the distal lumbar spine. Right now, this is trying to hit, we'll say L4, but look at how high her bottom is sitting off the table. Her bottom will never even touch the table or never even come close to approximating it because there's not enough stretch that can happen in those distal segments. And so right now, that large lumbar denerol is putting very little curve into that spine overall. And it's just propping her bum up in the air, probably being extremely uncomfortable. So this is not a good setup. You know, just note that as a rule of thumb, the large lumbar denerol never goes at L4 or 5. It is just simply too big, unless your patient is like 6'6 six, six or 6'7, six, fine. But for the majority of people, this is only used for L3 and above. The other thing we look at is the amount of shift or translation. A small lumbar denerol does not cause any translation in the lumbar spine because it almost fits perfectly into the lumbar spine. The peak pushes on only one or two segments. It's a nice rule that, that is used when patients have a fairly neutral posture. If they have an inch of posterior translation. So if they shift back an inch further, now I'm thinking about a medium lumbar denerol. And if you look at the height difference, the height difference between the medium and the small is approximately what? One inch, right? So if they shift a bit further back and I want the lumbar spine to be pushed further forward, I use a medium. If they shift back two inches, so I put about 50 millimeters or more here, now I can get into my big gray block. And if I'm going to use the big gray block, almost always, we're going to put the, a white support block behind the rib cage so there isn't too much of that thoracic extension because this baby creates a lot of that. So here's an example in sizing. We looked at this young man's posture and we looked at his x-ray. He was the example that I used. He was the indicator. Remember, we talked about a posterior shift. We talked about a reduced sacral base angle and a reduced curve. And if we look, he's shifting back 46 millimeters. So I put over 50 in my indicators, but again, those are guidelines. You can use your discretion. This young man is fairly flexible. He was 21 or 22 when he came to see me. No degeneration to his spine. He's about 6'1", 6'2". So he's tall, he's flexible, young with no degeneration and a pretty strong shift backwards. I'm gonna choose a large lumbar denerol for a candidate like this, okay? improving compliance. So we know, for those of you who have used these, and if you have it and you're going to use them with your patients, please do me a favor, lay on it yourself first. You should try any single dental roll you're ever going to give a patient so you know what they're going to experience. The lumbar can be very humbling. If you have any lumbar problems, any degeneration, any pain down there, it can be a challenge. So oftentimes the hardest part is getting people to do it at home. They're not going to be compliant because it hurts too much. So I've got four pictures up here on the screen. Okay. One, two, three, and then four. They're all kind of the tips, the tools that I use for patients at home to be more compliant so that they can use the dental roll with less discomfort. Number one, obviously, is the cat cow. We talked about this already. An exercised warm tissues, an exercised lumbar spine is going to lay on a roll much better than a cold, stiff spine. So exercise, number one. Number two, I just said it, cold, stiff spine. If we also want to warm up the tissues, let's just use a hot pack. So I'll often ask patients to just put a hot pack on their low back prior to laying on it, or if they can, they can warm up a hot pack or two, and they could just drape it over top of the lumbar denerol like this. And so now when they're laying on there, they have a hot pack that's basically relaxing the tissues, making it simple and easy for them to lay over top of it. Number three is cover it with a blanket. So cover it with a blanket or towel. So I fold up a blanket or towel in a couple of, you know, fold it over two, three times. So it creates an inch or so cushion. This just makes the dental roll softer because it's softer. It's not as painful. It's not as direct force. The patient can lay on it and then probably tolerate it a little bit easier. The fourth option is to what I call lessen the peak. So here I have these foam blocks that I use for my traction setups in the clinic. So those are soft foams, okay? They're compressible. So it's not like a rigid foam or anything. So patients at home could interchange this with just folding up a couple towels, but I have them fold a towel at the base of the dental roll, fold a towel behind the dental roll. And so if I look now at the excursion or the, di the distance between the top of my towels and my peak, I've just created basically a smaller dental roll. I've made the excursion less, which means the dental roll is not as forceful and it's more comfortable for the patient to lay on. So those are kind of the four strategies or the four techniques that I use. I kind of discuss them or try them all with the patient in office oftentimes, maybe not the hot pack because I'm not going to go heat it up, but I'll try, you know, options three and four 
I'll show them, okay, if we cover it with a towel or a blanket, how does that feel? Versus how does it feel if I build up with blocks on either side of the dental roll? Which one do you like better? Whichever one they like better or they're more likely to do at home, that's the one I send them home with. Okay, so that's how I increase patient compliance using the dental roll. Lumbar case studies. Okay, so let's go through a couple of case studies to see if the information I presented could be put into practice. Um, I'm going to just describe the case, and based on the case that I described, I'm hoping that you know, you're going to answer this to yourself. You're going to say, I would choose a small lumbar dental roll, and I would place the peak at you know, L4, or I'd place the peak at L3 based on the clinical picture that we're going to give you here. So we're going to go through three uh, lumbar cases, and then we'll open it up for questions. So we have a female. She's five foot two. I measure her, not her curve. She's got 19 degrees of lumbar curve, and she has a 19 degree sacral base angle. So I have one indicator. She's got a reduced lumbar curve, yes? She's got a reduced sacral base angle, yes? So we have two indicators. If I'm looking at size alone, 5'2", it's pretty tiny, right? But, you know, theoretically, potentially a medium because she's not a pediatric patient, but she is small. So size alone, you could potentially think of a small as well. So the last missing component is let's go look at translation. If I'm looking at her posture, she's almost perfectly lined up. If anything, you could see that the shoulder dot, if you're looking closely, she's represented by the red line. The green line would be like that perfect neutral reference line. So in posture, her shoulder is slightly anterior to her pelvis. If I come over to her x-ray, we look at T12. If I draw a line down from T12, same thing. It's going to bisect you know, a little bit anterior to my posterior S1. So she's got the tiniest little bit of anterior translation. Okay, so based on anterior translation alone, I really only have one choice for a dental roll. I hope everybody understands that. I cannot give her a medium because the medium will push her too far forward and she's already slightly forward. Okay, and if I look at her spine, really, you know, the curve between one, two, three, and almost up to four doesn't look too bad, but she stops. Like there's no curve here. Four, five, S1 is pretty flat. So I also know that I want to get a peak right here at L4-5-S1 to increase the distal lumbar spine and increase that sacral base angle. So by default, I only have one real good choice here. I'm going to give this lady a lumbar dental roll. Now, I told you they were yellow, the smalls. When you have a dental roll table, they're black in office. So I just use my black lumbar dental roll. But this is a small lumbar dental roll. Okay? So this is how I would set her up for home. If she needs a cervical curve, we can also give her a cervical dental roll which oftentimes if they've got a flat lumbar curve, they typically also have a reduced thoracic curve and they typically, not always, typically have a reduced cervical curve. So please assess if they need a cervical dental roll and have them lay on it at the same time. We're gonna get better results like that. So I would have this lady lay on her back with a lumbar dental roll and a cervical dental roll and I would place the peak as close to L4-5 S1 as possible. In other words, the tail will slope towards the head, okay? This is her after three months when we do our first re-x-ray, when we check in to see how things are doing. This is her curve after three months. She goes from 19 degrees on this side to 37 degrees on this side. Wow, right? How do we do? Fantastic. Uh, sacral base went from the same thing, 19 degrees to 37 degrees. This is one of those wow cases. Now, I'm not showing you this to make you think that every single lumbar dental roll that I give to a patient is going to turn out like this. To quite the contrary, they're not all this good. This is one of those perfect cases that I love to use because it shows you what is possible when you choose the right dental roll, you have the right patient who's compliant, who does their things consistently, and they follow through with your care recommendations in office and getting their adjustments and such. So here's a great case where we saw almost a perfect correction after even only three months. But they're not all like this. But sometimes when you choose right, you can see these beautiful changes that are very easy to obviously uh, communicate to the patient thereafter. So let's show you a case that wasn't like one of those perfect unicorn cases. We have a male who's 5'10". Okay, So if all we're doing is size, if this is too complicated for you, we could just say, what size? He's above 5'9". You could, in theory, give this patient a large. But if we dive in a little bit more, we might change our mind about that based on a couple of other factors. So he's got a 20 degree curve. Is that less than 40? Yes, that means I have one indicator. He has a sacred base angle that's 22 degrees. Reduced from 40? Yes, I have my second indicator, okay? Also, I put it in here that he's stiff. So that should be a second piece of information that is gonna make me consider as to whether or not I wanna give him 
a large lumbar dental rule. So not only that, he's 5'10", so he's just above the cutoff for a large. But now that I've added stiff, maybe I'm thinking, hmm, because he's not that tall and he's stiff, maybe I should consider possibly giving him a medium. Well, now the factor that might you know, change our decision is how far backwards does he shift in posture? How large is his posterior translation? So I put a dot at the pelvis, we put a dot at the AC joint, and I think everybody could appreciate that this gentleman is backwards, right? So he shifted backwards compared to um, the thorax is backwards compared to the pelvis. If I look at it on x-ray, it's measured for me here, it's 22 millimeters. So it's almost exactly one inch backwards. And everybody I think can see his lateral full spine. He is the red line. The green line is the ideal reference line. There's about an inch of shift backwards in his entire posture relative to reference line. So the fact that I only have an inch, he's just above the size frame for a large and he's stiff. Should we choose a large or a medium? I made the clinical choice to give him a medium in this case, just based on the fact that he was fairly stiff. Now, this is the only picture that I had, but I think in his case, I would have flipped the tail down the other way. Why? Because he really needs the peak at approximately L3, maybe even L4. He needs kind of curve globally throughout the lumbar spine there. And with the tail down towards the bottom, sometimes it's hard to get it low enough, right? And it was touching my tailbone and you can see it's probably pushing at L1, L2 on me. And in this case, I would have flipped it the other way to get the peak a little bit lower down so we can get a more global uniform curve throughout the entire lumbar spine. Okay. I would give him a, a support behind the rib cage, at least an inch. This would be about the max you'd want to give him. This is the three inch support, 70 millimeters. You would not want to go more than this because more than this, you take pressure off the lumbar dental and reduce some of that force that's going to help correct. But yes, you want to give them at least an inch of support if you're going to use a medium lumbar in this case. And again, you could see here that the patient had a flat neck curve. So I also gave him a cervical dental roll at the same time to do at home. At my first re-exam check-in, when I take my first x-ray after three months, what does it look like? So we have before, and then we have after. So we look at his cervical curve. It went from six degrees to 12 degrees. Okay, not bad, six degree change. I look at his lumbar curve, 20 degrees to 24 degrees. Again, these are, there's not a blockbuster change, right? But if you're going to add up all of these small changes, they should all be communicated to the patient because the global picture change, and this is a, a male in his mid-50s, and only after three months, we're starting to see positive change, right? That's where the encouragement comes in. We continue on. We push forward. I look at how far he shifted backwards. It was 22 millimeters, and now he's down to nine millimeters, so over a 50% correction in that shift backwards. His sacral base angle was 22 at first. It's now 23.5. So I've got a slightly increased cervical curve, lumbar curve, improved thoracic posture, and a slightly increased sacral base angle. So although neither of those measurements are like jaw-dropping blockbuster, if I put that whole clinical picture together, is this patient improving? Are we seeing signs of change here? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. And I'm presenting this case so that when you're measuring these changes and presenting report of findings to patients, understand that small changes are still absolutely worth celebrating. And those small changes, they just continue to happen slowly over time. Okay, one more case, maybe the most complicated one. Here is a 42 year old female. She's five, six. Okay. So she's pretty you know, almost perfect. If you're thinking size alone, you're thinking medium lumbar general. If I look on my film here, the green is reference line. She's red. You know, you could see that there is some posterior shift here. I don't, I should have put the measurements up. I don't have the exact measurements in how far she shifts backwards, but let's call it approximately an inch backwards. She has a 12 degree lumbar curve. So is that reduced from normal? Yes. Sacral base angle, 24 degrees, reduced from normal? Yes. And again, my red line on x-ray is behind my green line. So there's some posterior shift. So I have all three indicators to use a lumbar dental but there is one little thing about this x-ray that I hope a lot of you caught and I've written them down right here. There are some pretty heavy levels of instability in her spine. A retrolisthesis, I'm sure all of you know, is when one bone slips backwards over top of the bone below. So in this case, I'm seeing a retrolisthesis at L3-4, 4-5, and 5-S1. So in other words, bone number three is shifting backwards over top of number four, four is backwards over top of five, and five is backwards over top of one. And they're pretty substantial, 5.1 millimeters, 4.1, and 3.6. So you know anything above 
millimeters. So anything above two millimeters is, is starting to become unstable. We'll call it like a mild instability. Anything above 3.5 millimeters is moderate to grossly unstable. So here's a 42 year old female who has moderate to gross instability at multiple levels in the lumbar spine. Do you think that if she does nothing, are these gonna continue to get worse? Obviously, I'm asking a question to a bunch of docs. I see some heads nodding. Yes, everybody agrees with me. This, this is the lady at the 19th hole. That is the sick one, not the healthy one, right, Yuri? So in this case, we have to take into consideration that we have to be careful where we place the peak of the dental roll here. You don't ever want to place the peak of the dental roll below a retrolisthesis. So if you think about it, if I lay her on her back, if you flip that x-ray on the back and I put a peak pushing L4 forward, well, if there's nothing supporting L3, in theory, it could just continue to shift further back. So when you see levels of retrolisthesis like this, you always want to put the peak above them. So in this case, you know, by default, I'm going to put the peak here at about L1, L2. Based on her size, her height, I'm thinking that I should be able to use a medium lumbar dental roll here. And you're right, you could. But this is one of those where you're going to choose a medium lumbar dental roll when they show up to the clinic to do their dental roll coaching, their doctor's report, however you're doing it to give, that, give them it, you're going to lay them on it and try it. And here's a case where she's not going to be able to handle it because it's too painful for her, and I'll give her a small instead. But... I would choose a, a medium. And so I put a picture of a medium because I think a medium is more appropriate. But again, based on factors like the clinical picture is always also what can the patient tolerate. So here, this would be the perfect setup for her, just like the last picture. But this one is correct because I'd want my peak right here at about L1, L2. I want that rib cage support driving everything forward. And if she needs a cervical dental roll, you put the cervical dental roll in. Now, again, remember I told you she did not tolerate the medium. So we gave her a small. But even look at laying on that small, look at the difference it made when we took her first post x-ray at three months, okay? So this is obviously pre, this is post. You see a, a reduction in that translation, right? So she got some reduction in translation. Her curve increased by five degrees. So not a huge amount, but still it's important. Her sacral base increased by three degrees, but where the real change is, is right here in the stability. So the, the 5.1 retro went to 2.6. 4.1 to 1.7 and 3.6 to 2.6. So although there are still two levels of mild instability in her lumbar spine, we went from three levels of gross instability to two levels of mild instability. This is a drastically different picture for this young lady now, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years out. This is a drastically more stable lumbar spine. And that's where you have to understand that the structure dictates the function. Right. So the more that spine breaks down it's a vicious cycle, it'll continue to go from there. If she continues now to do her dental roll and get her adjustments, can we continue to improve this curve closer to normal? The answer is yes. So now, based on the fact that her size dictates that she could use a medium, could I put her on a medium now if I want to keep pushing that spine a bit further forward and correct things more? The answer is yes. This is where you could transition the patient to a larger dental roll. However, I wanted to show you guys this that you can also simply just use one of these blocks, okay? So those are called dental elevation blocks. It's a 20 millimeter block. And basically, instead of having to pay for another, you know, $50, $60 lumbar dental roll or charging the patient $85 for a lumbar dental roll, you could just purchase these $10 elevation blocks from the site where you buy dental rolls, and then you could just pop that under. So here's the small lumbar dental roll. I add the elevation block, which fits perfectly underneath, and bow. Now I have the equivalent of a medium lumbar dental roll, right? It just lifts the profile, makes the block a little bit more challenging. So when the patient is ready to progress to the next level, instead of giving them a new orthotic, which is costly to you and the doctor, you can buy these little elevation blocks and they are perfect to then make the lumbar dental roll more challenging, okay? And that's it. I think that's all I have for you guys. So there's that final slide, which shows you the coupon code. And the one video I forgot to show you was there's also an instructional video on my YouTube page about how to use the lumbar dental roll. So actually placing it under the patient, how they lay on it, how we take them off of it. This is important to know, obviously. So you can go to the YouTube channel. There are plenty of videos there, but one of them is how to lay on and get the lumbar dental roll out from underneath of the patient. So there's the coupon code that gives you 10% off all dental rolls or dental roll products until October 18th. And then my contact information and you guys know the rest. So we can open it up for questions. So <laughs>